from the World Economic Forum at Davos 2024 and in conversation with Manish Kedriwal of Kedara Capital. There are multiple ways in which Manish is known. I'll just introduce him as somebody who's been here for such a long time, gets the pulse of Davos so well. And Manish, an important time considering that in a, in a disjointed, fragmented world, India seems to be that oasis of stability, calm, and investability. How, would that be a correct way to characterize this? You know, the moniker I would use for this is the credible, incredible India. Okay. Because I think for the first time, we actually have all the ducks in line, right? We have um, a geopolitical situation which is almost deglobalization globally, right? Increasingly, India is playing a larger and larger role. Under the leadership of both Minister Jai Shankar and, uh, and uh, Doval, I think we have a foreign policy, obviously under the Chaturchaya of our Prime Minister, which is a very unique uh, foreign policy. We're actually, without being a bully, stating a fact as it is, we're doing what's in the best interest of India. Of course. We're not letting other people drive our agenda. So geopolitically, and we are credibly needed. The US needs us to balance what's going on in China and in the Middle East. We, like you said, we're an oasis of peace and calm in a region which is strife, whether it's Taiwan and China, whether it's the Middle East, the Hamas and Israel. And increasingly, it's if I move on from geopolitics to the economy, while India has always been reticent and relatively insulated from the global uh, trade flows, uh, and the local markets are so large and growing, this sort of a growth rate for an economy already so large is unprecedented, right? And finally, with that, what we have, I used to say in the past, we invest in India despite the government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. For the first time, what we're seeing is not headwinds, but tailwinds. The government is actually edging us forward. The, the, the economy as a whole, and we're all, and how is that? Whether it's infrastructure, whether it's the digital stack, whether it's governance. These are areas which, in the past, you could have said you're investing in India despite things not working. Yeah. Look at Bombay. You, the Trans Harbor link was opened up. You live in Bombay. Yeah. I mean, I, my wife went on that on Saturday. Uh, we were going to Pune. Uh, as soon as the coastal road was ready, and then the metro. I mean, I think Bombay itself, who would have thought in our lifetimes we'll have this and we'll be able to go to the new airport even sooner than our local domestic airport. Yeah, well, inshallah, hopefully that happens too. But so Manish, that, that's, that's the reason. I mean, you would have been speaking to investors ahead of the forum yeah. for the last one month. Yeah. It's a new calendar year. You're sure you got a ton of meeting lined up here. Is the India interest a bit higher than what it was last time? Because last time it was, it was loud and to the point of it being a shrill. Is it as loud or louder this time around as well? You know, I think the whole shrill thing, I don't know if the shrill is from the investors or the shrill is from ourselves. Okay. All right. So firstly, I want to say the sort of, you know, the paintings on the buses, I'm glad we're not doing it this year. We're calling it Credible India. In addition to being incredible, we're doing much more content-driven interaction. Uh, Bollywood nights were good, but few and far between. Not every night shouldn't be a Bollywood night, right? We should be proud of our culture, but let's do the traditional dances, the Zakir Hussain's of the world. It's not just Bollywood. But there's so much more richer content, whether it's rich economists like Akita Gopinath, uh, the Ajay Bangas of the world, our businessmen, whether they're conglomerates, all our startups. Yeah. We are in a phenomenal situation right now. So I think there's credibly a significant interest in India. Mm. And that interest, I think, is genuine. But now let me peel the thing one more. What's happening, right? When you see what's happening in China, and people often ask, is all the capital that's going to China coming to India? That's not the case. Not and that will not be the case, right? China has its own place. There is a temporary slowdown. It's also a very large market. There's lots of geopolitical complications. China will be back. Uh, so I don't think we can substitute for China. We can be in addition to China. We can take more and more market share from uh, an Apple's manufacturing of iPhones uh, oh. into India from China. But I think the, the swing or the, the pivot will be the pools of capital which have already been raised. Here I'm talking, see, we are Kadara, uh, Multiples, uh, Chris Capital, Everstone. It's India focused. We don't know and don't want to invest it. We're relatively small, simple guys sitting on the wall. 
the global guys are much larger. They raise Pan Asian funds in addition to their global funds. So KKR, I think, did a seven or eight billion dollar fund. So did Bain. Carlisle on its way, TPG's done that. They used to allocate money across all the Asian countries. But the, it, it varied back up. But I would say a very broad generalization, between 40 to 60% of that capital went to China. Right. India was only 10 to 15%. China is gonna freeze, at least temporarily, even in these Pan-Asian funds. So that 50 or 60% money is gonna go where? It's not gonna all come to India. Japan is an incredibly yes, attractive yes. market, sure. especially for guys like Bain Capital. They made a ton of money out there. So some money will go to Japan, but India, the force, will go from 10 to 20 percent to, I'll say, at least 30 to 40 percent of those funds. That's an incredible amount of new capital coming into India, and that's coming in. So these guys will be enhancing the size and the quality of the teams domestically. You've seen an interview with, uh, with Henry, of KK, of Henry Kravis of KKR. He talks about significantly enhancing investments in India. He's been around for 25 years. He's an Indophile. He loves the place. But there were some challenges he had in terms of how I, I think that's changed as an example. The other big shift, again, we won't do this. We're simple private equity guys. Our job is okay. We do three, four, five deals a year. We raise capital. We deploy it. We transform the companies we invest behind and hopefully have an exit and a DPI to our investors. The global guys are far more diverse. We don't want to be like them, but what, they, what are they doing? I think today in India, Blackstone is probably the largest investor, mm. but their real estate investments is actually larger than the private equity already. And both are very large, but it's the second largest market outside of the US. So all of them, if you look at Blackstone, if you look at KKR, suddenly infrastructure, which was so far a government domain, or that of the Canadian pension plans, or the Brookfields of the world, is being by traditional private equity players. So their shift in India also, we will stick to doing private equity in our songs, but these guys will move to do a lot more of that. I mean, the largest deal, sorry, just struck me, Larry Fink and BlackRock, you saw they bought our GIF. That will be a transformational deal. The amount of capital now available to, uh, GI, to GIF, the amount of money that BlackRock will be putting into infrastructure. Of course, there's demands for capital everywhere, but GIF already has a presence in India. Hmm. I think the amount of money coming in from private sources for infrastructure is going to be significantly higher, and you can see the projects in the old days, there was an environmental issue. There was some other issue. Yeah. Projects got delayed. People are seeing the execution capacity and the capability and the helping hand. So you're attracting private capital in addition to the public capital that was coming, whether it was Japanese money, Singapore money, or Canadian money in the past. Very interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a difference simply because, I mean, you say this at the point of time when Fairfax has gone out and said that we are increasing the stake in the Bangalore airport, want to buy more airports, so on and so forth. Uh, here's one question, though. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, 2023, 22 and 23, arguably, also shown the depth of the Indian capital markets, right? Wherein FIs were able to take an exit without a big damage to the tape. Now, my and and 2020 was a year of IPOs with so many coming out as well. Uh, my question is, uh, the, there's a flurry of newer sectoral companies and newer companies coming out, which are not necessarily by definition large. Traditionally, the penchant was for investing into larger names because there is saf safety and liquidity. But the newer companies are all small by definition. What happens therefore to money? Does it chase these newer companies or does it kind of bide its time until these guys grow? See, I think uh, you're making two points. One is the depth of the capital markets. It is phenomenal. I mean, as private equity, we look for exits. We do our control exits to strategics, whether there are strategic companies and global companies looking coming into India, or financial sponsors. We sold, ad, we sold one company to Advent, one to Warburg Pinkers. We were in the process of selling one other company to KKR, right? So those are happening on the private side. It's a private to private transaction. The company's on list. On the other hand, as private equity, we have a bunch of companies we've already listed where we've got an exit. Manuar is one such case. But others where we've exited partial stakes but still have a controlling state, for example, in Avas Housing or a Spandana Microfinance Company, suddenly the depth of the market is so deep, you can actually have blocks and secondary transactions of amounts which were unprecedented earlier. You saw KKR outfloated almost its entire stake in Max Healthcare. That was a billion to $2 billion of capital switching hands in 12 hours by an overnight transaction. 
So that is one, the depth of the markets, both in terms of its appeal to portfolio companies and to private equity, because we're finally getting exits, both strategically and in IPOs and the secondary market. Right. To your question in terms of India is thriving for entrepreneurs. The reason we all gave up careers outside India and came back 20 years ago, you believed in not just the Indian consumer, but the Indian consumer was supplied by the Indian entrepreneur. It's a McDonald's is more Indian in India than yeah. it is globally, right? So that whole, uh, someone like an Amit Jatya and Smith are converting what was a global thing into, it's very, very unique. That is growing, the demand is growing. So I think obviously the larger business houses were always well capitalized. They had access to global pools of equity and debt. They didn't need a bit the smaller companies, which were initially, the, if you remember, there was nothing called venture capital 20 years ago. When my father started a textile company in 1978, or he listed the company. The markets were a venture capital, a form of venture capital for him. That's no longer the case. Companies go public when you're ready. And so if you take a Nika, first cry is going IPO. These were companies which essentially were driven by superb entrepreneurs, sure. whether it's Falgani Nair, whether it's uh, Maheshwari, it's superb in uh, first cry's case. The initial capital was venture, but now, they're going to stand on their own. They don't need private equity. They don't need venture capital. And the depth of the market will... Now, what will happen to valuations will be a reflection on performance, which is growth in margins, and governance. Okay. The moment you see a drop in governance, there's going to be a collapse in market. But I think a lot of these companies today, which were the smaller types, the thirst of capital was sort of quenched by, in the past, by the soft banks, the alpha waves of the world. That's drying up a little bit. But... The more later private equity like ours, all the global guys like the Blackstones of the world, as well as the markets themselves, will be our largest competitor to private equity. But for the entrepreneur, what a fantastic choice to have. Okay. Well, and, and, and hopefully it only improves. My, fi my final piece, uh, really, uh, and, and uh, a, a small one at that, but... Uh, for a lot of Indian companies, as well as global companies, this unprecedented uh, geopolitical crisis, Red Sea, for example, is leading to an uptick in cost. Do you think near term those factors hurt uh, corporate India or you think uh, they'll tie by it? You know, I think there's always a balance, Neeraj. And Indian corporates have dealt with stuff and challenges much deeper than this, such as the non-availability of oil itself or the price of oil or the cost of money and the cost of interest. So while a supplier, a, a logistics transporter suffers because his shipping is going to the Swiss, goes through the Horn of Africa, the length of time and the expense increases. Suddenly my friend uh, Bharat uh, and uh, Ravi Shet of Great Eastern Shipping, I'm sure are the beneficiaries, right? Suddenly the capacity utilization of their ships. Well, that's a small the set. Of course, but I'm just saying, it depends on what you define as your focus, right? If you define your focus only as companies supplying oil or the oil coast, fine, they'll suffer, but the higher price of oil will make up for that. But even as they suffer, there are other beneficiaries like the shipping companies. Total sum remains sort of equal. Okay. The only way the total sum changes is if there's a change in productivity. But you're right. I think my point is if you see what the Americans and the Brits are doing in terms of attack on the Houthi rebels, that will get resolved. There's a bigger problem behind that, which is to be solved, which is Israel and Hamas. And then the proxy war being played between Iran, uh, the US, yeah, yeah. Israel, Saudi. I mean, before this whole thing started, if the Saudi, the Israelis were about to have a bond of, I won't say friendship, but at least an agreement of peace, that would have been a game changer. The attacks by the Hamas, and maybe that was the cause of it, uh, changed that, but I think this is temporary. Okay. I mean, I think uh, the longest war seems to be the Ukraine war, but people are forgetting about it, right? I mean, I hope people don't forget there's a final answer and things are resolved and our nonstop flights to New York resume. But I'm saying these are temporary blips. The strength of our um, entrepreneurs, and I think now backed by the government in order to support them, is unprecedented. So I look forward to a phenomenal decade ahead. Uh Cross fingers for all of that. But lovely talking to you, Manish. Thank Thanks, you so much for taking the time out being with us. You.